In this lecture, we will be discussing an old favourite, namely Mac. You might be wondering why a whole lecture has been devoted to this one topic. Now it's true that when it comes to pharmacology, I can be accused of wringing a flood out of a damp cloth. However, I hope to show you that there is a lot of information to be gleaned from this humble term. Let's start with the pop quiz question. What else does MAC stand for? I can think of two answers. As you've probably guessed, this lecture was written with a live audience in mind. But seeing as that's not possible during a pandemic, you'll have to watch me play hangman with myself. Here is the answer. MAC is defined as the minimum alveolar concentration of inhaled anaesthetic agent at steady state and at sea level that prevents purposeful movement in response to a 1 cm forearm incision in 50% of rested, healthy, unpremedicated 40-year-old men. This is a very wordy definition, but each of those ingredients is necessary. I'd like to draw your attention to a few of them. Firstly, MAC pertains to nitrous oxide and xenon, as well as the volatile anaesthetics, therefore it's more appropriate to use the word inhaled or inhalational rather than volatile. Second, given that MAC is almost always expressed as a percentage rather than as a partial pressure, we should specify that the number only applies at sea level. Lastly, I've highlighted the word purposeful here because it's a very important qualifier and one that is often left out. I would suggest that a better way to define MAC is to state the straightforward definition and then to list as many of the special qualifiers as you can recall. Here's another question. We know that 50% of the population won't move at one MAC but that isn't much good to us. How much anaesthetic does it take to stop 100% of the population from moving? The standard deviation for MAC is 10% and so almost nobody will move at 1.3 MAC. Many of you will know that answer already, but consider that it is a lot less than a lay person might guess. All the action happens across a very narrow range of concentrations. There are several variants of MAC worth knowing about. MAC immobility, as we discussed, is the concentration at which half the population won't move in response to a noxious stimulus. MAC awake is the concentration at which half the population won't obey verbal command during washout. MAC hypnosis is about the same as MAC awake, but is said to be a little higher due to pharmacodynamic hysteresis. That's to say, the concentration required to put a patient under is ever so slightly higher than that which is required to keep him under. MAC amnesia is the concentration at which half the population will not recall a noxious stimulus. Heading in the other direction, MAC endotracheal intubation is the concentration at which half the population won't move at laryngoscopy. MAC bar is the concentration at which half the population won't mount an adrenergic response to a noxious stimulus. I've listed the approximate MAC fractions pertaining to each of those variants. Note that MAC and its variants are agent specific. I encourage you to pause the video to review these numbers. The third question is, why is the concentration causing immobility the reference point that we use. Why not unconsciousness? Shouldn't we care about that more? The answer is that the concept MAC was coined following experiments performed by Ted Eager and his colleagues on dogs, in whom unconsciousness and amnesia are much more difficult to discern. That's not a problem in and of itself. However, for some reason, we all seem to run patients at 1.0 MAC, no matter the circumstances. The point I would like to make is that there is no reason why we should do this. 
it's the case that the risk of awareness in a patient at 0.8 MAC is negligible, and suppression of both movement and the adrenergic response can be achieved by means other than administering more volatile anesthetic. If we run a patient at 1.3 MAC for a 6-hour case rather than 0.8 MAC, the patient will remain still, and there won't be much difference in cardiovascular toxicity, but there will be substantially more drug accumulation and therefore a slower wake-up. On the other hand, there are times when we do want a MAC fraction at much higher than 1. For instance, during incision and drainage of a perianal abscess in a young patient, where the risk of laryngeal spasm is high, and the procedure is brief enough that drug accumulation is not excessive. Here's another question for you. The concentration of volatile anesthetic required to keep half the population still is about three times the concentration required to keep half the population unconscious. That's the difference between MAC and MAC awake. We all know that propofol is far worse at keeping patients still because of its lack of effect on the spinal cord. But how might we actually quantify that equivalent difference? The answer is in this graph from the textbook by Hemmings and Egan. On the x-axis, we have anesthetic concentration for both propofol and halothane. On the y-axis, we have the fraction of patients keeping still. The first thing to note is this. The median immobility concentration for halothane, i.e. MAC, is about twice that of its hypnotic concentration. For propofol, on the other hand, the immobility concentration of 15 mics per mil is more than seven times its average hypnotic concentration of two mics per mil. That is a staggering difference. The second thing to note is how drawn out the propofol curve is compared with the halothane curve. We know that almost every patient will keep still at 1.3 mac, but for propofol it isn't until 30 mics per mil that all patients will be prevented from moving, or nearly all. I don't know about you, but I'm not running 30 mics per mil on my TCIs. One question to ask yourself at this point is, what effect does remifentanil have on the curve for propofol? We can say for sure that the curve is left shifted, but I expect that the gradient is made steeper as well. This huge discrepancy probably has something to do with the relative faithfulness of propofol to the GABA-A receptor in comparison with the highly promiscuous volatile anesthetics. We pay for that, of course, with more nausea and vomiting, more emergence delirium in children, and a not-so-nice wake-up quality in general. Or at least this is how I would think about it. In summary, there is both a short way and a long way of defining MAC. I suggest you learn a definition of MAC that will get you good marks, but will not make you stumble in a viva. The concentrations required to achieve the various anaesthetic endpoints are wide-ranging. Synergistic interactions between the drugs we use in anaesthesia are extraordinary in both their magnitude and in their clinical utility. This is true for both the inhaled anaesthetics and for propofol.